Shalom. Welcome to the Shepherd's Light Online Church. Before the service starts, we wanted to invite you to join our chat. The chat is where you can ask questions, share verses, and connect with other viewers from around the world. Just write your first comment and choose a nickname to join. If you need prayer, click the live prayer icon and you'll be taken to a private chat where one of our team members will pray with you. The service is about to start. Don't forget to sign up so you can keep your username and profile. God bless you and enjoy the message. Please. 
Desire, a greater thing to treasure. I'm convinced there's nothing better than living in your love. Caught up in the wonder, of being in your presence, knowing such a friendship.
the beauty of heaven all around me. Your power and your mercy, the greatness of your Well, God bless you and welcome home. Bukhim Habim Abayta. So good to be back again with you this week. And thanks so much for coming again today. We realize it's not always possible to travel to a service somewhere, to fellowship with the other people there. So as you know, we bring that service to you. Wherever you are, you can be anywhere in the world, anywhere in Israel. That's where we're trying to reach today. And we'll bring that service to you wherever you are. We hope you'll be encouraged today and you discover God's peace and His promises for your life. Now would you open in your Bibles to the New Testament today. We're still in the New Testament. Remember how we say that in Hebrew? Habrit HaChadasha. Habrit HaChadasha. The Testament or the Covenant, the New. The Covenant, the New. That's how we say it in Hebrew. Habrit HaChadasha. And we're going to be still in the book of Mark today. We just started Mark not too long ago. We're going to finish up chapter 2 today. We went through more than the first half of chapter 2 the last time I talked to you. We're going to be in the last part of chapter 2 from verse 18 on through the end at verse 28. That's where we're going to be. And as you know, probably we'll also put those verses right up here for you in the video just to make it easier for you to follow along. I'd like to talk to you today about phases. Phases, in other words, the stages that we go through and that things go through. You know, there's times in life when it's appropriate to do one thing, to do things one way in your life. And then there's other times when it's appropriate to do things in a completely different way. <laughs> That's true in nature as well. A little baby wears a diaper at first, but later they begin to wear real clothes. The little baby eats only certain kinds of food at first, and they don't have really any teeth to chew other food. And, and But a grown person eats other kinds of food, and sometimes we eat even things that we probably should not eat, like Rocky Road ice cream. Yes! Oh, never mind. <laughs> Got a little carried away there thinking about those pictures of Rocky Road and a big old bowl in front. Never mind. We're talking about the scriptures today. Well, in fact, as we grow up from being a baby to an adult, we go through different stages of life or phases of life, if you will. And that's true because we learn to talk at one time. We learn to listen at one time when we're young. But then that doesn't happen all at one time, does it? We learn a little bit at a time. And at first, we learn the words. And then we learn to put the words together in phrases and sentences. Finally, we learn how to start learning what is being said with words. And we listen for the deeper meaning of what's being said for the story there. Now here's what God's Word tells us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, everything has its time. You probably remember an old song, everything turns, 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 everything has a season, right? That was taken from this verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And it says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to harvest what is planted. So the Bible says that God has times that He's assigned to things. There's a time to do one thing and a time to do something else. This is the Lord. He could have done it to where He does the same thing all the time. But He chose to make creation like this to where there is a time for everything. So you see, it's normal in life also to go through these stages or phases of life where we're little, we first learn to talk and listen, and then as we grow up, we learn how to really understand what's being said. We understand the story. We understand the purpose, why that person is saying those things to us. And that's what we see today in Mark chapter 2 in these verses, verses 8 through 18. So let's begin now at Mark chapter 2. 
And we'll go through these 11 verses to the end of the chapter at verse 28 today. And as you know, always we stop every once in a while as we're traveling through these verses on our journey through the chapter. And we'll talk about what this all means and put it in context together. So in these verses today... I want to tell you, there's really four pictures that will help us understand the heart of God in these verses and how He does things and why. Starting at verse 18, the first picture is going to talk about revealing the bride and the bridegroom. People didn't know this about the Messiah when He was going to come. They just thought He would be a a good guy that would bring peace in the world. A lot of people didn't even know that He would be the Lord Himself. But that was a reason for that. He was going to take our sins upon Himself, like the Tanakh had said, in chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah. That's how God had said that He would be a suffering servant to give His life for the sins of many and make many righteous because of that. And so we see that now, looking back in time, that that's what Yeshua did. Jesus, as you would say his name in English, Yeshua, or salvation of God, as you would say it in Hebrew. But it was these first verses now are going to reveal this concept of the Messiah being the bridegroom. And he was going to take his bride, all of his people who believed on him, and loved God, and He would take them to be His bride. And in heaven one day there would be this beautiful wedding feast with the bridegroom taking His bride, and we would live together in heaven forever to be with our Heavenly Father, the Father God. And so we see these things. Now let's start in verse 18. It says in verse 18 of chapter 2 in the book of Mark, the disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. And then they came and they said to Jesus, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples, they don't fast. And Jesus said to them in verse 19, He said, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. Now, what's going on here with these first uh, three verses, verse 18, 19, and 20? You know, the Bible really only teaches in the Tanakh, in the Torah, it only teaches that there's one day a year to fast, and that's for Yom Kippur. You know what I'm talking about. (laughs) You you know what I'm talking about. You do that 24-hour fast right before Yom Kippur, the day of Yom Kippur. And you do that fast. That's the only place in the Bible where you're commanded to fast. So why were the Pharisees and even the disciples of John? And John was, of course, a believer in Yeshua. God had pointed out Yeshua to him and said, This is my son. This is the Messiah. He's the one. I told you I would show you who he is, and there he is. And John witnessed and saw the Holy Spirit, heaven opened and the Holy Spirit descending out of heaven and coming upon Jesus and staying with him and and dwelling there on Jesus when John baptized him there in the Jordan. So John knew. He had been told by God, he said, Whoever you see the Holy Spirit descending from heaven and staying on him, this is my son. This is the Son of God. John saw that. And so now the disciples of John were also fasting at this time. And the Pharisees were fasting. What's going on there? I mean, we only have one day in the Bible that it says to fast every year, and that's, a, you know, the 24 hours before Yom Kippur there, and, you know, all the people in Israel know about that. And so we see that. So why are the disciples fasting and the Pharisees were fasting? This wasn't Yom Kippur at this time. Well, it turns out that they fasted quite a bit. In fact, Judaism had changed over the years to where in the in the first and second century there, it turns out that they were fasting about two times every week. Two times a week? Well, that's different than one time a year, Stephen. Why were they doing that? Well, I'll tell you. You know, when God says something, He says what He means, and He means what He says. But sometimes people look at that, and they like to 
put their fingerprints on it. They like to say, well, we're going to change it and make a name for ourselves. And sometimes gradually over time, I mean, they come up with reasons. Well, fasting is good. We should fast while we pray because that shows that we're humble. So let's fast. That's okay if you make that decision to fast. Fasting is a good thing. You don't just have to fast on Yom Kippur in the law. You can make that decision to fast at any time and humble yourself before God. But when you start teaching that as God commanding people to fast at all these other times, two times a week, that's where the problems come up. And it turns out that gradually in Judaism, Pharisees, scribes, Sadducees had added things to the scriptures that weren't from God. But since these were supposed to be people who represented God, the people said, well, it must be from God because these righteous people, these people who say that they're so holy, they're doing this all the time, so it must be from God. And so now we see today in chapter 2, verse 18, 19, 20, the Pharisees are fasting and they're doing this two time a week fast. The disciples of John even who believed in Yeshua. John pointed out Yeshua, now they believe in Yeshua. But even they're fasting two times a week. What's going on? What happened? How come they're fasting so often? Because it's easy when man adds something to the Word of God that before long everybody just assumes that well that's what God wants us to do. But if you go back to the start of it all you see that God didn't command that. Now is it okay that they're fasting? Yeah. It's okay to humble yourself before God. The scripture teaches us to do that. And in the book of Proverbs and throughout the Tanakh, throughout the New Testament as well. And, and we're going to see that in different places in the Bible. It's good to humble yourself before God. But when you try to make it a law as if God said to do it and he's commanding you to do it, you're adding to the word of God. And the scripture says when you add to the word of God, you have to be careful because God will add to you the plagues that are written in the book, you see. But if you take away from the Word of God, then God will take away from you your place in the book of life. And you won't be able to enter into the kingdom of heaven without repentance there, you know. So basically you look at that. And the disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. They came to Jesus and said, why did the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast but your disciples don't? Now, Jesus didn't take issue with them about fasting. He knew that it was perfectly fine to fast, to show humility and humble yourself before God. But look at what Jesus said in verse 19. Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Why was Jesus saying this thing about a bridegroom. Because that is the plan of his father. His father God sent him not only to save mankind, but all who believe on him will be the bride of the Messiah. And so Jesus is the bridegroom coming now to bring the message of the kingdom of God to all who would believe on him that they would be saved and be given everlasting life and they would be brought to heaven with him a wonderful marriage ceremony feast in the kingdom of heaven where we will dwell with our Father God with our Messiah Yeshua the Holy Spirit will we will dwell with God the one true and living God forever and ever and ever he's the bridegroom coming to take us away. And the rest of us who believe on him, well, we're the bride of Christ. We're the bride of the Messiah. Collectively, I'm saying, you know. And so basically, the, Jesus is saying the bridegroom, and he knows what people know about the wedding. They think of a wedding as a, a beautiful, wonderful, joyful thing there. It's a time of joy. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of great joy to all the people. And you're not fasting, you're not trying to be sad during that time. So Jesus says, I'm the bridegroom. Can the disciples, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? No, it's a time of joy and celebration. But later when the bridegroom is taken away from them, that's when they'll fast. And the Messiah is saying, look, 
I teach them how to pray. I teach them how to walk with the Lord. I teach them what the Word of God says and everything. I'm doing that while I'm here, but the day is going to come when I'm taken away, and then they will fast. Then they will humble themselves before the Lord. Then they will pray and ask the Lord for strength to make it through because there's going to be persecution later. So he's saying as long as the bridegroom is with them, they don't fast. But the days will come, he says in verse 20, when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. That's the first picture or the first illustration, I guess you would say, in our four illustrations today. The second one is in verse 21. And Jesus goes on now to tell them this same truth in a different story. Because they're basically saying, why aren't you doing the things of the law? And they're saying that, well, we added to the law, but you're, you're not doing the things that is traditional that everyone else does. All the religious people do. And Jesus is saying, well, first of all, I don't have to do that because that's not what was in the word except for the one day of Yom Kippur, the fast. But I'll show you something. Now that we're talking about the law, he says, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. Now what's that talking about? You know, nowadays many of us don't have sewing kits and needles and threads and things like that and a lot of people don't know how to do that. When something tears they just go down and buy a new shirt. They go down and buy a new dress if you're a lady or something. Things like that. But sometimes they'll try to, tear, uh, they'll try to put it back together and sew something back together. That's okay, but Jesus is telling us something really about the science of this. Those of you who have bought new clothes know that the first time after you wash them, the second time after you wash them, somehow they seem smaller on you. They seem tighter on you, right? And you go like, oh my gosh, I've eaten too much Rocky Road ice cream. And look, I've grown up like a balloon and now this thing that did fit me before is like real, real tight on me. That's not you. There's nothing wrong with Rocky Road ice cream. Hmm. I asked, I asked the Lord that I would say what he wanted me to say. I guess that must be true. There's nothing wrong with Rocky Road ice cream. But I pray that that's the truth. I know it is. Nothing that enters the mouth of man will defile a man. But what comes out of the mouth of man from his heart, that's what defiles a man, you see. So anyway, away from Rocky Road ice cream, back to the cloth. When you have a new piece of cloth that you're going to sew onto an old garment that's torn and a hole has torn out of it. You can't just pull it together and sew it. You have to put some other cloth there. You find some cloth that matches and then you put it there. And you buy some cloth. You sew it back together and everything. Well, if you wash it, that new cloth has not been washed yet, so it shrinks. Well, why is that a problem, Stephen? You said the other cloth is already shrink too. When it, when it was washed, it's already uh, shrunk. So what's the problem? Well, the, that is the problem because the other cloth had already shrunk and the new cloth had not yet shrunk because it had not yet been washed. So when you sew that new piece of cloth onto that old garment with the hole in it to fill that hole up to where the garment is now uh, okay and everything's covered and that hole is fixed now, and you wash it, that piece that you put in, the, in that hole and everything in the middle, that's going to shrink and pull together and it'll wrinkle up the garment and it won't look right. In fact, the tear has actually been made worse. It now draws attention to everything. It's just not fitting because the new piece of cloth wasn't shrunk, but the old one had already shrunk. So Jesus is saying this basically a scientific observation. He says no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old. It like shrinks in, starts tugging at the seams and the stitches that were sewing it on to that old garment, you see. And he says the tear is then made worse. It puts pressure on it and now it'll be made worse especially if you eat too much Rocky Road ice cream. But that's a different story. Guess what I'm going to do after I'm finished with this message? I think we have some in there in the freezer. That's not part of the message. Anyway, that's the second picture here that we see. Don't mix the old 
with the new. Now why is he saying that, Stephen? Why is he talking about garments? Why is he talking about sewing and cloth and all of that? Because the people were talking about the Torah. They were talking about the law, the 613 uh, commands written in the Torah. So it's in there and everything. They're talking about all these commands. And Jesus is saying, God is doing something new. My Heavenly Father is doing something new. He didn't say this, but I'm sure it was in his mind in the book of Jeremiah in the Tanakh, in chapter 30, verse 31, I believe it is, at 31, 31 maybe. But basically, it's right there. It says, God says, in the Tanakh, to the Jewish people, through the Jewish prophet, Yeremiyahu Hanavi, Jeremiah the prophet, he says, The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, and it will not be like the covenant that I made with them when I led their fathers out of the land of Egypt. It's not going to be like that covenant. And by the way, when he said, I'm going to make a new covenant with Israel and the house of Judah, you know the words he used there? Brit Chadashah. Do you remember that word from when we started this message today? Habrita Chadasha. Habrita Chadasha. Where have I heard that before, Stephen? Because now Jeremiah is saying that God is saying he's going to make a Brit Chadasha. Oh, yeah. You told me earlier when we first started this message that that's how you say New Testament in Hebrew. Habrit Chadasha. Wait a minute, Stephen. I'm Jewish. We're not supposed to use the Jewish New Testament or the Christian New Testament. But God is saying that's from Him. Now, who told you not to use it? God told you to use it. Right there in the book of Jeremiah, you can look it up. We told a lady one time, a Jewish lady, we showed her right there in the Tanakh, in the Jewish Tanakh, says it right there that God's going to make a new, new covenant. Same word as testament, new covenant. And so... Uh, she says, where? And she read it and everything, and it said, Brit Chadashah. That's what they call the New Testament, the Christian New Testament. Habrit Chadashah. And she goes, oh, I bet God was mad at Jeremiah for putting that in the Tanakh. That's what she said. All because some rabbi had told her that, no, Habrit Chadashah is not good. And God said it's good. Maybe you should stop talking to all these people who have all these opinions. Pick up your Tanakh and read it for yourself. Who's right? If someone tells you that the theology of Judaism says this and the Word of God says to do something different, who are you going to believe? Are you trusting in man or are you trusting in God? You have to make a decision. Who do you want to who do you want to please? Do you want to please man and what people think of you? Or do you want to please Almighty God? I'll tell you, you're only around on this earth for a few years. You have the opportunity to be in heaven forever and ever and ever. Who do you want to please? You believe the Word of God. Let that be the anchor. If you're just out there just listening to what people say, any person, whether it's a religious leader, whether it's a secular leader, or a whole group of secular or religious people, when you're listening to them, they all have different opinions. You know that. Everybody's got a different opinion. And so basically, when you're listening to them, things change all the time. You're like a boat out on the water in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. And the wind is tossing and moving you from one place to the other. And you don't have an anchor to hold you at one place. And so you start drifting away. I heard the story in the news not too long ago, about a week or two ago, about a man who... Uh, had lost his sail and everything and didn't have a, a motor, ran out of gasoline and his sailboat couldn't go anywhere and didn't have it anchored. And he was found 250 miles away out at sea because he wasn't anchored. Now, if you've ever been on a little boat like that, a sailboat, you look out and if you can't see land, it just all looks the same. Just waves and water and water and water. Just all looks the same. It's easy to think when you see that, that, no, oh, I'm not going anywhere. All those waves look the same. I must be at the same place. But no, those waves are moving. The water's moving. You're actually moving. You just don't know about it. This man was moving for all this time, 
and they found him 250 miles away. He prayed. They found him. When you are not anchored to the Word of God, you're going to be tossed around by the waves and the wind, moved all over the place because you won't have anything to depend on and to anchor yourself to in life when you're listening to the opinions of other people. But when you anchor yourself to the Word of God, you're going to be safe. You trust the Word of God. If anything goes against the Word of God, you don't believe that other person. You believe what God says, and you'll be safe. Do what He says, and you will be safe. You see, so Jesus is saying, don't mix the old with the new. You have a law there. I know those things were written in the law. But Jesus is saying that was for a certain time. That was for one phase in God's relationship with man. And now that the Messiah has come, there is this new phase where God spoke about it in Jeremiah the prophet. says, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, a new covenant, Brit Chadashah with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. And it's not going to be like the covenant that I made with your fathers, he says to Israel, when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Mitzrayim, the land of Egypt. It's not going to be that way. He says, Stephen, that's blasphemy. You're saying the Torah is not, is not in force anymore? Say, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's, don't get upset at me. It's God who said it right there in the book of Jeremiah. In, in the Jewish Tanakh, just read it. Tiftok, check it out for yourself. It's there. He said, God is saying there's going to be a new covenant, number one. Number two, it's not going to be like the old one. That must mean that the old one is now replaced by the new one. Well, they work together. They augment each other. They work together. The Old Testament prophesied about the Messiah and showed the heart of God to the land of Israel and revealed himself to mankind through the chosen people of Am Israel, the nation of Israel. The New Testament then shows the Messiah and how he fulfilled these prophecies that had been mentioned in the Tanakh. All of them. Every one of them except for the ones that are now going to come to pass in these last days. But over 300 prophecies fulfilled by Yeshua from the Tanakh. What's the odds of that happening in any one person's life? They say that the odds of even eight of those prophecies happen is just so vast and so astronomical that it can never happen. It's just, it's like a one in billions and billions and billions chance of one person fulfilling eight of them. But he fulfilled over 300 of the Tanakh's prophecies. Is he not the Messiah? Is he not the Mashiach of Israel? The one who would save all mankind? He is the Messiah. He is the Lord. And only by believing in him can we be saved? If you believe on Him, you believe in your heart that He is the Son of God, the Messiah, and that God raised Him from the dead and He gave His life for the sins of the people, that all who believe on Him will be saved, you will be saved and given everlasting life. And that's the promise of God. I told that to one Jewish lady one time. She says, Stephen, our rabbis say we can't know if we're going to heaven. You can know. You can know because God himself promises that whoever believes on his Messiah will not be ashamed, that he will be saved, that they will be saved and given everlasting life. It's throughout the Bible. It's always about believing. It's not about doing a bunch of works. Just like it says in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abraham believed God, and that was counted to him as righteousness. Oh, Stephen, he didn't have to do all those 613 commands all the time, every day. Remember them all. Try to remember them all and say them and try to memorize them and do them every second of his life so he would not sin. God said Abraham believed God, and that was counted to him as righteousness. It's right there in the Torah. Do you believe the Torah? It's right there. Tiftok. Check it out. You see, it's right there. And Jesus is saying the old 
and the new, now that the new has come. The old and the new don't mix. Now think about this. I know some Christians who got caught up in this works type theology. And they say, oh, I'm getting connected with my Jewish roots. I want to start keeping the law. Keeping the law so I can make God happy with me. The Messiah has already kept the law for you and atoned for your sins. Believe and that will be counted to you as righteousness. Don't try to mix the old with the new. It's not going to work. Don't try to put that new cloth on that old garment. The two are different. They can't work together. Don't try to mix them. Stay with the pure gospel, the good news. Habrita Chadashah, the spoken of in Yeremiyahu Hanavi, Jeremiah the prophet. Batanach, Ziaimet, Nechon. Betach, Ziaimet. Zimiha Navim, Nechon. Ken, Zimi Elohim, Nechon. It's from the Word of God. It's from Jeremiah the prophet. It's from the prophets. It's the truth, right? Of course it's the truth. Now, that's our second picture. Don't mix the old with the new. Now we go on down to the third picture that we want to talk about. And we see here, Jesus says another picture so that people can understand. He says, no one puts new wine in old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins. The wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But he says, but new wine must be put into new wineskins. Stephen, what's he talking about? I mean, we buy wine in bottles, and you know, we order a glass of wine at a table. Some people don't order anything, of course, with alcohol and everything. And some people have had real problems with alcohol. So it's, you don't want to tempt that person, even if it's okay for you to have a half a glass of wine uh, every once in a while, once a year, two, two times a year, whatever that is. It's all in moderation. Now, I'm not talking about alcohol and whiskey and stuff like that. But we see that God allows things in moderation. I don't drink it. And the reason why I don't drink it is I work with a lot of people who've had alcohol problems. My family, my stepdad, my father, other members of my family have had problems with alcohol. I don't drink even a half a glass of wine around them. Because they have seen alcohol destroy their lives. And when they finally left it, they've been gone away from alcohol now for years and years. And it's just not right for other people to be doing this around them. Because they might be weak and they might want something that is going to be bad for them. And they become addicted to alcohol. Again, they become alcoholics. And in the same way, a lot of people... It's okay to drink a half a glass of wine if you do that every once in a while. But think about other people. It's not about you. Think about of other people, what they're going through, where they came from, their history. And maybe God will teach you not to do that when you're around them. Or you may want to just get rid of it altogether so it never ever becomes a bigger problem, you see. So anyway, Jesus is talking about wine, though, in old wineskins and how the new wine can burst the wineskins and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined. What's going on there? Well, it's kind of like that thing that we talked about the cloth, the new cloth and the old cloth. Only here, he's talking about new wine and old wineskins. Now, here's the thing you need to know about wine and wineskins. You don't need a, to be a wine enthusiast to understand this, but new wine is in the process of expanding. It expands out the fermentation process. It expands out. If you were to fill up an old wine skin with that and seal it, that new wine starts expanding, blows it up like a balloon until it splits and breaks and the wine spills out and the wine skin is ruined. That's the way it works with the new wine and the old wineskin. But Jesus is saying, you don't do that. You don't put the new wine in the old wineskins. You don't mix the old with the new. And then he says, but you put the new wine into new wineskins at the end of verse 22. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. 
Well, Stephen, a wineskin's a wineskin. An old wineskin, new wineskin, what's the difference? Because when the leather, when the wineskin is new, it also is stretching out. So you put the new wine in the new wineskin, the new wine, the fermentation process stretches that wine out, and the new wineskin itself is being loosened and stretched. If you've ever had a leather coat or some clothes from, you know, a suede leather or something, you know that they stretch out over time just like other cloth does, except leather is the same way, you see. And so you put new wine into new wineskins. And then if they're both stretching, then and by ah, there's no problem. There's no problem there because they're both stretching. If you put the new wine in the old wine skin, old wine skin is already stretched out years and years ago. It's not going to stretch out anymore. You put the new wine in there and the new wine is stretching out, it's going to burst the old wine skin. But if you put the new wine in the new wine skin, both the wine skin and the wine are now stretching out. You're not going to burst that new wine skin. It's not going to spill out, ruin the wine skin, and lose the wine as well. You see? That is the other picture, the third picture that Jesus is telling us. It's just confirmation of what we said a while ago about this cloth, sewing it onto the old garment, the new cloth onto the old garment. What was that? That was about don't mix the old with the new. What is this? Otro de water. Exactly the same thing. Exactly the same message Jesus is telling us. It's the same thing. I'm just telling you in a different way so that you'll understand it. Those are the three pictures so far that Jesus is saying in these last few verses on the last half of chapter 2 in the book of Mark. The fourth illustration, the fourth picture, is going to be coming up now as we read verse 23 through verse 28. It says in verse 23, Now it happened that as Jesus went through the grain fields on Shabbat, as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. They would pluck it off of the grain and everything because they needed something to eat. And the Pharisees, they had been watching Jesus, trying to find out what he would do wrong so that they could accuse him of not keeping the law. And the Pharisees said to Jesus, Look, why do your disciples do what is not lawful on the Shabbat? But Jesus said to them in verse 25, Have you never read? What David did when he was in need and hungry, he and those who were with him. Verse 26, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest. And he also gave some to those who were with him. Jesus is, and then said, verse 27, 28, he said to them, Shabbat was made for man and not man made for the Shabbat. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Shabbat, the Sabbath, as you would say in English. So we see now that here's the Pharisees, and they're watching carefully. They've come. We covered this last week when we talked about the first part of chapter 2. Those Pharisees and the scribes only came to try to find if Jesus was going to do something wrong. Why were they so jealous of him? Because people were coming to Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees had been putting on a show. They were telling people how righteous and holy they are. And they looked down on other people and they go, Oh, I don't even want to bother talking to you because I'm righteous and, and you're dirty and sinful. They had this holier-than-thou attitude, you see. They thought that they were above everybody else. It reminds me of some politicians I've seen. Maybe some people I've seen. You know, and I think sometimes... Probably everybody's been tempted to think those sorts of things. You look at somebody else, you compare them to you, and you say, Oh, I'm better than that. But before God, we're all sinners. We're all desperate in sin, and we're greatly in need of a Savior, and we're bound for hell without our sins forgiven. And those who believe on the Son of God, Yeshua HaMashiach, will have their sins forgiven and they will be allowed into the kingdom of heaven. We're all saved by grace. You're not saved by works. You can't get there from here. You can't get there from here. You might say, well, I can jump really high. Well, you can jump really high. Okay. Maybe you can get your feet this far off the ground. Maybe you can get your feet this far or even this far off the ground. Maybe the greatest, highest jumper in the world could get his feet this far off the ground. 
as he's standing up there in the air and, and the bottom of his feet are way up to here. And I, I remember Michael Jordan had a 48 inch vertical leap. The bottom of his feet would be 48 inches, four feet over, over a meter. And, you know, anyway, uh, you know, over four feet high and one of the highest jumpers that ever lived, Michael Jordan, you see. And you may think, well, I can jump really high. But you don't understand the standard of God. God says, you can't get there from here. Any sin that you have, and you're not going to be able to get in heaven, doesn't matter how high you could jump. You could jump to the moon, and it's still not enough. God's standard is perfection. In other words, you have to never, ever, ever sin. Because you can't get into the kingdom of heaven if you've ever had sin in your life. If you have sin in your life that's not forgiven. And it can't be forgiven unless you believe on the Son of God who gave the atonement for you, for your sins. And if God sees that you believed on His Son, a Mashiach, Shalom, a Ben Shalom, His Son, the Messiah, His Messiah, when God sees that, He looks down, He sees the blood of His blemish-free Lamb, the Lamb of God, the Messiah, the Son of God, on the doorpost of your heart. And when he sees the blood of his son on your heart, he says, he has believed in my son. She's believed in my son. And he opens the doors of heaven to where you can come in through the gates of heaven. Because if, they, if you still have sin, it's not forgiven by believing on the son of God. You cannot get into the kingdom of heaven. The tree of life is in the kingdom of heaven. God's throne is in the kingdom of heaven. He will not allow any sin in his kingdom. You say, Stephen, that's a New Testament concept. No, it's not. It's in the book of Yehezkel Anavi, Ezekiel the prophet. God says, the soul that sins, it shall die. But he also says how to do the atonement. The story, the picture that Pesach made. He says how to do the atonement. When you believe on the Messiah and you put the blood in, his blood on the doorpost of your heart, symbolically saying, I believe on the, on the Lamb of God. God looks down, he sees the blood of, of his Lamb of God, the Messiah, on the doorpost of your heart, and he passes over you in judgment. You won't be judged for your sins because your sins have been put on the Lamb of God. He is a kippur, a kapara. He's the atonement for your sins. And only by believing on him can you be saved. Friend, believe on him today. Jesus then said to these Pharisees who were concerned about these disciples picking little grains out of the, out of the, out of the ground and the plants and everything so that they could eat a little bit. And the Pharisees said, look, why are they doing what's not lawful to do on the Shabbat? And once again, Jesus said, didn't you read in your own Tanakh? The Jewish Tanakh, didn't you read what Hamelech David did, what David did? When he was in need and hungry, he and his men with him. Verse 26, how he went into the house of God in those days, in the days of Abiathar, the high priest. And he ate the showbread in the holy place, which is not lawful to eat except for the priests. And also he gave some to those who were with him, to his men who were protecting him and keeping him when they were running from Shaul, from Saul. As Saul was trying to kill David. And verse 27, and Jesus said, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now, this is a very important thing. Many, many of the religious authorities in Israel, not all of them, but many think that, oh, the Shabbat. You have to do every everything on Shabbat. It's all about Shabbat. You don't understand that God made mankind in His image. And He rested on the seventh day after He created the heavens and the earth. Bereshit bara Elohim et ha-shamayim v'et ha-aretz. Chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Genesis. God created everything. He rested on the seventh day. And He did that not because God was tired. He's almighty. He's all powerful. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't need to rest. He rested so that it would be an example for man because He knew that man would need to rest. And man can't work all the time. Man needs time to get away. Mankind needs time to be still and know 
that God is there. And to think on the things of God. Jesus is saying the Sabbath, this rest that God did, this rest that God made, the Shabbat, that was made for man. Man was not made for the Shabbat. Man was not made to talk about the Shabbat. Man was made and given the Shabbat as a time to rest and rest before God and listen to the things of God and to draw close to God and to stop all of his labors, stop all of these things that he thinks so important. Well, I've got to earn money. I've got to go to work on this seventh day. And No, you don't. If you trust God with that day, God's going to take care of you. The rest was made for man, not man made for the rest. The Shabbat was made for man is what Jesus is saying and not man being made for the Shabbat. And then he says in this, therefore the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Shabbat. That's interesting, isn't it? Here he is, God, the Son of God, saying that the Son of Man, yes, I'm the Son of God, he's saying, but I'm also the Son of Man because I was born of the Virgin. And as the prophets had said, and I came into this world, and my father gave me a body of a human, and that's what I find myself in so that I could be sacrificed as the sacrifice for the sins of mankind because sin was brought into the world through man, through Adam and Eve. Therefore, it must be atoned for through man. And yet it had to be a blemish-free sacrifice without sin, but no other man had ever lived, always keeping the law at all times, except for Yeshua, Hamashiach. And so he qualified, and so he is called the Son of Man, even though he is the Son of God as well. So he says, since I'm the Son of Man, the Sabbath is made for me to rest and keep it. And just like Hamelech David, just like King David in the Tanakh, I'm giving to my friends food to eat and letting them take this food to eat. Just like David was able to take the bread, the showbread, out of the holy place. So I'm telling them it's okay to take this grain from the field and eat because this rest was made for man and I am the son of man. So Jesus is commanding that it's okay and that he is also Lord of the rest, the Lord of the Shabbat. He's the Lord. He's the one that put this into place. Now, those are the four pictures that these few verses paint today. And you see this theme in here that there's phases. There's times that we do things one way, even God. There's times when he did things one way when he gave the law of the Torah. But then there's other times when he's talking about doing things a different way, like in Jeremiah, the same Tanakh, when he's talking about how he's going to give them a new covenant, and it's not going to be like the first one that he gave them. Even God says, there's times when I'm going to do things this way, but then there's times when I'm going to do things this way. Well, why would God give the first covenant? Because it had the 613 commands. Well, you see, mankind is kind of a proud type species. They look at things and go, well, I can do that. I can do that. I feel real good today. I've had my coffee. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through. I'm not going to sin all day long. I'm not, in fact, I'm not going to sin anymore for the rest of my life. And God says, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have the strength. You don't have the wisdom. You're going to forget. You're going to fail. You're going to fall. For temptation because Satan is stronger than you he can tempt you when your sins are forgiven by my son though by my uh, Messiah in his atoning sacrifice for you then your sins will be cleansed and you will be sinless but you trying to do it on your own you can't do it so he gave them the law and the Torah to show man that you can't get there from here you can't do it 613 commands. You can't even remember them all. Even if you could, you can't do them all every second, every moment, every month, every year of your life until you die. And the first time you sin, you forget, oh my gosh, I messed up. I did it. I did it. Then you're a sinner and you can't get it in the kingdom of heaven. You don't have everlasting life and you need a sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. There's a time for everything. 
God used the time of the law to show man how holy you would have to be to earn his entry into the kingdom of heaven. You would have to be perfect because God is perfect. He doesn't let sin in his kingdom. God says there was a time for the law so that I could show mankind that they need a Savior. And now there's a time for the Savior to all who believe on him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's in the book of John, chapter 3, verse 16. John 3, 16. It's really the gospel in a verse. There's a time for everything. And today, if you don't know the Lord, today is your day of salvation. You're not guaranteed another heartbeat. You're not guaranteed another breath. You're not guaranteed people fall over dead. I've, I've read two stories about healthy athletes and one actress who was a beautiful young lady, 32 years of age, fell over just dead. No one knew there was anything wrong. An athlete fell over just dead. Very fit, very in shape, just fell over just dead. Football players, bas basketball players, people who are so healthy, and this happens even to them. You don't know when your last day is. Let's change that. You don't know when your last second is. One person died last week, a famous person of an aneurysm. An artery there in the brain just bust. And within seconds, he fell to the floor, collapsed to the floor, couldn't think about anything, couldn't do anything, dead. They couldn't do anything for him. I'm not trying to scare you. But I want you to be given everlasting life. And when you give your life to God, by believing on His Son, He will be the one that keeps you safe. And regardless of what happens in this life, you will be brought into the kingdom of heaven and have everlasting life. Chaim Nishim, everlasting life is yours for believing on the Son of God. Amen? Why don't you give your life to the Lord today, completely, right now? If you call out to Him, He's going to hear that cry. He hears every thought of your heart before you even speak the words. And He will answer you. He will rescue you from that darkness that you're in. And you will know that you have everlasting life and that He is in your life and He will shine His light on your heart and you will be given this everlasting life and He will see you safely into His kingdom because you put your welfare, you put your life into His very capable hands. He never slumbers nor sleeps. He watches over you. He's all powerful. He loves you so much He gave His Son for you. You see, He is the one who can save you. Your own actions can't do it. It's not enough. Zalom speak. Zalom speak. Atalom mushlam, lechon. Afechad mushlam. No one is perfect, and yet He will see you into His kingdom if you put your life in His hands. He'll change you into a new person. He'll throw all those past failures away. Forget all those past sins. You'll be made completely new, given a new start. And He'll give you everlasting life in heaven. And that's guaranteed by the promise of God Himself. Friends, I want to give you an opportunity today. Please, please, don't put it off any longer. Please. You believe in Yeshua as the Messiah and the Son of God, the Lord and you will be saved. You will receive God's peace in your life, in this life now. You can be saved and given this everlasting life in heaven by simply believing that God sent His one and only Son into the world to save us from the judgment of sin because your sins would be forgiven. You can receive this everlasting life by just praying something like this. Repeat it after me if you'd like, but remember you need to mean it in your life. Just say something like this. God, I do want to know you. I do want to have this real peace in life. I really need real peace in my life, Lord. I do believe on your son, Jesus, the Messiah, as Lord. 
Please forgive all my sins. I give my life to you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I want to tell you some good news. God heard you, number one. Number two, He's already started working in your life. A little seed's been planted deep down in your heart. You've given your life to Him. Over time, you're going to begin to see the wonderful changes that He's making in your life. You get in a good Bible-based church. Don't listen to politics and people's opinions. You go to the Word of God. And if they're teaching the Word of God, that's where you want to be. If they're not teaching that, if they're teaching what someone else says, get out of there. Go to a place that teaches the Word of God. You go through the Word of God. You learn about Him every day in His Word. You talk to Him every day in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. And He's going to do beautiful, wonderful things in your life. Where there is new 